Yeah, because tomorrow's one. Yep, today's Tuesday. So. All right, well, we're recording now. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Emily Metcalf. I am the um, instructional services librarian here at Bell Library and I run the book talks. Um, today, Suzanne Bonds is giving a book talk and we are super lucky to have her because she has such such great energy and she is um, clearly a lover of books. And so I'm really glad, Suzanne, that you're here to talk to us today. Um, just for folks who haven't met you yet, um, Suzanne Bonds is the, um, she's a licensed professional counselor. She's been at TAMU CC for 13 years and one month. Um, she is the liaison to Islander Athletics um, in the theater department. Um, she also attends the um, Fellowship of Christian Athletes uh, meetings and she's involved with ICAT. She's been involved with ICAT for five years. She's very passionate about it. Um, and she is also on staff council and she serves on the wellness committee. So she's really, she's well known across campus. She's well loved across campus. Um, so Suzanne, I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself. Um, folks, I've got the chat up. If you have a chat, if you have a question for Suzanne, you can put it in there. I'll make sure um, that I can read it out loud for you. Um, so Suzanne, go ahead and, and take it away now. Cool, thank you, Emily. Um, so Emily emailed me uh, late January and asked me, uh, had I had I any interest in doing this book talk? And I was, I didn't know who Emily was. I'm like, who's the strange person emailing me? Oh no, but she's not strange, she's lovely. And she had heard me speak at a faculty senate meeting last November and other times uh, where I often go on campus and speak in regards to the counseling center services I provide. Uh, because I'm on staff council, I'm a great proponent of wellness or on the wellness committee as well, a great proponent for wellness for our, our, our employees. So I did read a book over winter break and when Emily asked me this email and then we got to talking, she's like, any book you want, any book you want. I'm like, hmm, okay, well, I've read many books over the years, but most recently I read this book called The Great Divorce, which you would think it has to do with marriage, like a man and a woman, but it actually is, the title is our response to C.S. Lewis, who was responding to a, a poet named William Blake, who wrote a poem called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. So as I read this book, it really wasn't an accident. I was seeking something as a longtime uh, bereavement, grief and loss counselor. And certainly having experienced loss myself as a human being personally versus as a human being professionally, I decided to find something that was going to attend to my spiritual needs in many ways, and also the professional in me needs to attend to the needs of students that have lost their parents or loved ones, and that happens every semester. Uh, even this very semester, I'm, I'm counseling a number of students that have lost key people in their lives, and it's they seek counseling for me to provide comfort for them in some capacity about their loved one who was hopefully moved on, moved on from this earth. So when I came to this book, I read it, it's really short. Um, Emily will tell you that she she and the library purchased a couple of copies as a raffle. That's why they asked you for your name, uh, perhaps to, to win one of these books. And it's really small, but really deep. It's deep and meaningful. So one of the things that I had it personally experienced as we all have, we all have, experience death, loss, loss of someone who we adore and love and then leave this earth too quickly. And with the COVID happening since March, 2020 to at present, there are times where, and even before COVID, we lose loved ones and those loved ones may be our pets as well. They may be our pets that we adore. And it's, it's profound for many of us that have that connection with a human being or an animal and we're just told by society to move on, just move on and it'll be fine. So what do you do? Um, since I'm, not everybody can't afford counseling or, or have a stigma that I don't need counseling, it's fine. I'll just do something entirely different. And sometimes that entirely different may not be so healthy. So one of the things I think, what's up Lexi? Uh, one of the things I think um, was really cool when I read this book was it talked about, and Emily read it too. I lent her my copy of man, she was like, I got it. She read it fast. I was like, hey, no, that's fast. That's, that's fast reading. So uh, I appreciate her doing that because she and I discussed it. So C.S. Lewis is a little bit about, uh, about him. Uh, I never, with a capital N, <laughs> never read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
Chronicles of Narnia, but that is what he's typically most famous for. But he was a, a brilliant literature professor, a medieval professor in Oxford, England, um, and also had done as it was a late the theologian. He, he was a World War II veteran, and we'll probably go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm going to get into. So thank you, Emily. So there are learning objectives today, and um, I did, those of you who know me, I, I, I know it's one to two, but if it goes a little longer, I, I have the space to, the cushion to do so. Um, some people that I know wanted to come in late because they were in class, so they're like, I may show up late. I'm like, okay. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is there's a picture of the book. This is the copy that Emily purchased um, through the library. It's really nice. It's cool, I think. I have the same copy as well that I got at Barnes and Noble on the bottom shelf of the religious section. Um, so as mentioned, I, I never read Chronicles of Narnia. Um, since I've been preparing for this talk, I, I did watch it, I think on Netflix or Hulu or something. And it, I was like, I'm sure many people have read it when they were in elementary school, well, maybe middle school, high school, college, and maybe seen the Navy. So after I started reading this book and preparing for this talk, I became immersed in everything that is C.S. Lewis, including reading a, a book of his called The Screw Tape Letters. And though he's a lay theologian and he came to Christianity in his 30s, he was a staunch atheist. And this talk today is not going to hit you over the head with the Bible, so to speak, but really talk about his journey, in which I'll talk a little bit about his qualifications. I'll tell you about my reflection again a little further. Uh, and the slides will show you some of these things that I'll talk about. I'll talk about the book a little, the characters. I won't tell you how it ends because that would be mean. Um, so, and I'll we'll have some time to kind of analyze some of the things. So, I took uh, great pains to. I told Emily last night I listened to it again. So I've read it physically in my book and I listened to it twice. It's on YouTube also for those of you that don't like to read. Like you can watch it and hear um, hear the whole story on YouTube, which I think is real cool. And I, I watched it again last night, got some more insight, feel pretty stoked about it. So um, Emily did ask me before you, those of you that signed them up to smidgely, um, if you have any questions or comments in the chat, go ahead and throw them in there and, and Emily will, uh, Will tell me we won't wait to the end to ask ask and answer questions i'm like eh, just as they come up that's fine by me so um as mentioned we'll go on to the next slide um c.s lewis is this really cool guy he was a british army lieutenant in uh the world war one at, at age 19 so he actually is an irishman and he fought in the trenches of france and as a, and again, you just heard me say that he was atheist until his 30s. So by the time from 1917 to 1941, when he would go around England, war-torn bombed England, London, and he would ride on trains with the soldiers going to war and those coming back. And he was the second most, as I discovered, um, the second most heard speaker in London, England, and all of England, next to Winston Churchill at that time, which is pretty cool to me. And this guy was, you know, and he would do this. He would work as a professor at Oxford, and on weekends he would travel in trains across the country to speak about, give addresses about Christianity. And some of those addresses turned into this book called *Mere Christianity*, that he would speak to the layperson. It wasn't like he was speaking to the elite or the nobleman, and he would speak via just radio, BBC. And it got to the point where many people, lay people, workmen people, were like communicating with him, can I have a copy of your transcript? And he eventually would make these stories into a book called Mere Christianity, which this is the third book I'm reading now of his. So as it says here, he was a professor of religion from Oxford, and then uh, later in his career at Cambridge uh, for medieval and Renaissance English. But any of you ever read into that stuff, I think it's kind of cool too. Um, I can see that he would have been a really neat um, professor to, to be hearing about. So I did check out the one and only copy, which I think it, it, it's, I'm enjoying it. So also, as I said, he's a late theologian. And those of you that I've already talked about some of the other things that he has written that he's most famous for, uh, the screw tape letters. Um, it's he writes from the perspective of a a, a, a devil, a demon, um, a elder demon, 
writing letters to his nephew, a young demon, on how to steal the soul of human beings. And it's it's meant to be a satire, meant to be comical, but it's still meant to be immoral about you know, just watching out. So um, those of you, if anybody wants to put in the comment that they actually read the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that would be super stoked. Because uh, when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, like there's Judas. <laughs> so or like, that's supposed to be Jesus, the lion. Uh, so it's certainly pretty meaningful. Uh, he also wrote, and I, I didn't know this till as I was coming mean, later in my preparation, he wrote a book called Grief Observed. So even though I read The Great Divorce, uh, Grief Observed was based on the loss of his wife. He was married, he was married late in life, married a woman who was, I believe, also a professor, and she died after three years through um, a cancer illness. So if anybody knows a lot about grief and loss, it's this man having lost friends in World War One, World War Two, and things like that. So let's go on to the next slide. So um, part of my my uh, objectives is to, to really just be a little vulnerable here and tell you, uh, those of you that know me know that uh, I, like every human being, have lost people to death. And in 2021, uh, I lost um, a mentor of mine here on this campus. In 2017, I lost another mentor of mine on this campus who was in, in very near personal dear friend of mine. And also at the end of, in December of last year, I was writing my Christmas cards out. And uh, as I was looking for an address for um, a friend of mine who lives in another city I used to live in, who's also a therapist, all my mentors have been therapists, coincidentally, um, I discovered that she had passed away. And I conveniently communicated with her sons on as late as December 23rd and really talking to them about the loss. And they were like, man, she really loved you. You know, she waited for your Christmas card every year. I mean, I was like, picture Christmas card. And it was a really a blow for me having lost someone even the month before who's a mentor, now finding out a mentor I had um, many years ago in my early career had passed away. And to me, talking to her sons and really bringing comfort to them. But what do I do with all that energy and all that loss? Um, so I found this book. I started reading it. I, I just full disclosure, I'm a Catholic Christian. Um, I'm what's called a cradle Catholic, uh, which means that I was born into Catholicism and even had some Catholic uh, schooling as well in my um, primary Catholic schooling, attend mass regularly. Um, I do work in a secular building, <laughs> secular university. So when students do bring up faith, um, I will go there with them if that's what they so desire. Oftentimes I cannot unless, I mean, I'm not, I can't lie like, you should be believing you hit them in the head. I would never do that. So it's a matter of if they have it and want it. Um, Emily, and mentioned I'm doing some work with fellowship of Christian athletes. So I went recently and the lady, I introduced myself and she just like did my testimony. I was in the back like, hey, and that ball cap. And this is Suzanne, talk to her. She'll give you her testimony. I mean, she didn't maybe like five minutes before. I'm like, all right. She works at the counseling center. So I'm like, all right. So it was, it was nice. It was nice. So, um, so what I put in the slide is uh, reflections of spirit and souls. And, and I think I read one of the scholars, C.S. Lewis said, that we as humans have, we have souls, we, we are souls that have bodies. So we have souls that have bodies. So, and then certainly the spirits, like, you know, you think about spirits is like, you know, I gotta keep my spirits up. But I, I do have, uh, and I'm not here, I know that some of the, the people that are watching now presently, and those that may watch their recording in the future, I'm not here to try to convert you or anything like that. We're here to talk about this book. C.S. Lewis I made sure in the forward of this small book, to tell you, and I quote, I beg readers to remember this is a fantasy. This is a theological fantasy book. And he also added, but I need to, to remind you, I intended it to have a moral. And we're going to get into the book just momentarily. This is, uh, some of the scholars call this a, a pious or sacred fiction. They call it um, a theological fantasy, a metaphor, a satire. So it is pretty, uh, it's cool if you like a lot of character books or like characters in the book and in a little while I'll have a slide that shows you some of the pictures of what these characters are in the book and some of their, their issues that have had a hard time letting go of something that we as humans hold on to often, even maybe unto our death. And that's one of the things that, again, I give you a little bit of my reflection of, of having uh, lost some mentors that were very important to me to death. And knowing um, I counsel bereavement for over 20 years, 
and I want to attend to myself so I can attend to the students in the best way I can. So I do believe in God. I, I do have a Christianity background. Uh, I do believe in salvation. Um, C.S. Lewis has put, um, I put on the bottom slide here, purgatory is that process to allow our souls to san sanctification and purification. You hear some of these religious terms. You're like, what is that? You know, and I'm like, it's, it's kind of all uh, very similar. You know, it's we trying to kind of clean ourselves up. It's like if you were to go to a, a if you're working out in the field, you're playing out in the mud, whatever, and you got really dirty and uh, you went to someone's home and they're like, hey, well, come on in. You're like, ah, I really want to clean up a little. No, no, just come on in. No, you're welcome the way you are. Yeah, but I really want to clean up a little. So some of these biblical words of sanctification, purification, or purgation from purgatory is that process that allows souls to kind of clean up a little, if you will, for a simple way of saying things. But it's more in depth than anything I say. You could YouTube, you could look Google, like the more, the bigger scholars, I'm not a theologian, the bigger scholars say, oh, you know, give you like a whole dissertation of what purgatory is. But for simplicity's sake, this is what I put. So uh, I find that finding, a, for me, finding a comfort with my lost loved ones is super important. And, and, and when I counsel students, I always ask them, um, have, you, have you dreamt of your lost loved one? Has your loved one come to you in, in a dream? and or have you seen certain signs and it's comforting for them and i know it's certainly comforting for me and has happened to me uh, where my lost loved ones have come to me in a dream and i you know the brain is a really powerful tool right and i say that in counseling brain is a really powerful organ so if i'm looking for if i have the dreams of my lost loved ones and i know that when i see them i'm happy that makes me happy in real time, in real life, in, in wake up life. Like, you know, and, and when I'm awake, it makes me happy that even in my subliminal dreams, I'm happy and they look happy and they are at peace. So that kind of keeps me going through the day, if you will, when I'm feeling sad about the loss of, of my loved ones, if that makes sense. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, we'll go on and talk a little more uh, to the next page. Thank you, Emily. So the thing about C.S. Lewis, and again, um, this is the first book I've ever read about him or he wrote and he's just it's really brilliant i feel he writes in under first person perspective and those individuals that are english majors are english professors he talks about it having a um there's a certain english word where you the author put um looking for it on my notes you call it a, a satire manque m-a-n-q-u-e satire manque meaning that he put himself in this book he put himself in this book as as he is traveling along, and it is meant to be a satire, it is a theological uh, fiction, it is a pious fiction. So as the story begins, he said author, but he's, he's titled as the narrator. He is uh, inexplicably in a dirty town, in a gray town, they call it. He's inexplicably in this gray town. And, and it's kind of interesting because it starts off where he's just in queue, you know, it's English call it, but he's in the queue. And he's waiting and he sees this bus, this bus, comes down and he, people are arguing, people are arguing. So like arguing in the queue and then they, they exit the queue. And he's like, cool, man, uh, I'm one, one, one more queue up or one more position up. And then more people argue and, and then he's like, I'm two more positions up. So as he finally gets um, ready to get on board, he's just chewing, you know, he's just chit chatting with the people that are still in the line. And he asks this guy, uh, what, what's this about? What's this bus about? He's like, um, he goes, I look around this town and it's this gray town. I see um, windows that are shut and uh, see houses that are, have roofs that don't keep out that rain. And what is it about? He's like, oh, well, you know, what are we all in queue for? He's like, oh, we're going to go on a day trip. So throughout this, and this is probably a Latin word, throughout this book, you eventually find out that a couple of people are taking this day trip and they call it a refrigerium. And I think it's a Latin word for, as I put here, it's a day trip to the foothills of heaven from the great town. The people that are on this bus, they don't realize, uh, nor necessarily you as a reader, uh, that this great town is anything other than just some typical town in our, anywhere in the United States, anywhere in the world. So he is basically saying, this is, you know, this is where we're at. We're going to go on some trip. Cool. And he just doesn't know why I'm in this line. So when i read i was telling emily i actually um as i told you a moment ago i read 
listened to it last night and I think of like, you know, when you watch a movie a second time, you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't see that detail before. That, that's interesting. That's interesting. So as I, I, I listened to it really the third time, twice in order the first, I didn't realize that the bus driver, it represents Jesus. And this is what and I, I quoted, it says, so his, he's waiting in the line. He says, um, the bus driver seems full of light. Um, says all, look at that, all that gilded and purple. And it's just said in a sentence. And one of the ghosts said, he looks like he has a look of authority and seemed intent to carry out his job. So there's just a little bit of a hint that there's a lot of symbolism in this book. And, and I wasn't paying attention initially, but later on when they go on this bus drive, eventually it takes off and people are talking, talking about this book. And, and it, it, it's like, he describes as you're leaving this great town and you see the town below you, like when you're in an airplane, right? And it's dark and misty and it's never quite gonna be daylight. And as he, the bus ascends, you get into a bright open space. And one of the things that I, I picked out recently when I reread it was C.S. Lewis says, the bright open space was so large, it made the universe seem like it was indoors. If you can imagine, it made the, or you know what, I take it back. He said, the space up in this new country is so large, it made the solar system, that's what he said, made the solar system seem like it was indoors, which is really remarkable as far as his, his description of this book. So these people, so they, they, they go up to heaven, they get there, and they're not really know, quite know what to expect. So as I put here, the visiting ghosts are transparent. When they're in the bus, they're solid, right? Because they're in this, this dirty town. And as they go further into the new country that is representative of heaven, they start noticing they become transparent. And they get off the bus and they start walking in this, what well, they call the art country. So they are all of a sudden, they're, they're now referred to as ghosts. Ghosts from what now we know as a reader, it's purgatory. And they have these bright lights of people. A specific person comes out from this mountainous region area and they're bright. And they call them the bright people in this book. And you quickly figure out they are angels that are going to speak to these individuals that came on the bus. When they exit the bus, they are, what am I here? And they start noticing they become transparent. And as they try to pick up something that's, you know, around the, the area, one of the, the narrator, who's C.S. Lewis, he picks up a, he tries to pick up a daisy. And he comments that it's as heavy as a, a sack of coal. And they're walking on, because they're transparent, they're walking on the grass. And they said it hurt because it was as hard as diamonds. And they're not quite understanding. And later on, you'll see in this book, there is a big waterfall and there's a big, beautiful tree. And the tree has these golden apples. When um, the narrator was waiting in queue before the bus arrived, he talks to this man and he says, man, I'm going to go up there. Yeah, I'm just going to go for the day. I'm just going to go for the day. And I am going to take whatever I can from up there and bring it down here and I'm going to start a business and I'm going to sell it and maybe more people will come to this dirty town. Well, while they're riding the bus, I know I said they're ready to get off, but while they're riding the bus, and this is key, one of the, the men tells C.S. Lewis, um, I noticed, you know, when you're down at this dirty town, you simply have to imagine a new home and it it's created for you. It's created and people don't live in the same city or excuse me, the same blocks and they live further and further away because they're always quarreling. They're always arguing. And when they quarrel, they just simply imagine a new home to live and they move out further and further and further. So the narrator says, um, well, have you, have you seen any, for lack of a better way, people from history that have been down here? And he's like, sure, sure, sure. A couple of years, the first year I got here, there were some men that came down here and they had spent a year to see uh, Napoleon. They went and he was, he was arguing so much. He, he moved his home so much millions of miles away as has Genghis Khan, as has Henry V, as has uh, Caesar. So this guy is telling the narrator, uh, yeah, yeah, these guys, when I got first got here, these guys had just come back and haven't seen Napoleon. He was a million miles away. He says, I live on a hill. And even with my, it's a point of light. He says, by the time they got up there, he was pacing back and forth. He was pacing back and forth and he couldn't stop. So as C.S. Lewis is describing some of these maybe villains in history, he's talking about in just a sentence or two, even sometimes they being um, a victim, not a victim, a um, they're trapped in their own uh, obsessiveness, in their own evil and things like that and not even know it. So 
they arrive in heaven, they depart, and we start learning a little bit about the meat of the book is which few characters actually got off the bus and a specific light or angel comes and talks to them. And we start seeing as a reader, what is it they're holding on to? So the last thing I'm gonna say about Jesus is one of the ghosts is he's outside the bus in the new country. He says, um, when are we going back? As people do, when are we going back? So the driver says, you never need go back. Stay as long as you please. Though that seems really benign, um, and having read it again, it really is, um, I think it's like a, a future thinking of like, oh, okay, you know, I never need to go back. And, and the characters that are gonna start coming forward, which I have in the next slide, you'll see, we'll have it when we go to the next slide. The characters that start coming forward, um, these are some of them. These are uh, a handful of probably still yet many, I could have brought, wrote another slide for another slide of these characters. So this one right here is, um, what I put, I found as a, a, a queue, a dirty town of people waiting. And if it was bigger, you could see a bus that was there as well. So there's our dude, there's C.S. Lewis, he's awesome. And those of you that were um, ever took a literature class in un undergrad or grad, um, you read um, a lot of cool books. And one of them was The Divine Comedy by Dante. So he had, and I also, shockingly also watched it again read it again not all of it but i watched it just to keep up speed for its comparison to this book the divine comedy had uh dante he was taken through hell in um heaven paradiso with a guide so c.s lewis uses a guide in this character named george mcdonald so he'll be he'll be key a lot like dante had virgil when he went through the the layers of hell and then had uh, assumed into heaven to to do that. So there's our guy C.S. Lewis. And these people I put here, these are some characters that, again, what I found most profound about this book as I was reading it, the people that are talking to him are angels. They call them the bright people. And the people that are there, little by little, they realize they're on the foothills of heaven, essentially, the way Lewis writes it. And the people that have come out to meet them, tell them, you were in purgatory, as the book is written. And they're like, no, oh, no, no, no. So this one right here is an example. This, this guy in the white, he was a famous painter, famous artist. And he is, can't believe, so he tells his angel, he says, wow, this is awesome. Look at, look at this, this is beautiful. And everything you see, if you're ever interested, YouTube videos have small little shorts on each character of this particular book. So this artist, he's looking around, he's like, this is beautiful. This is beautiful, I love it. And he says, oh man, if I had my, my painting equipment, my painting scaffold and my uh, art supplies, I would paint it right now. So his angel says, there's no need. There's no need to do that. He's like, well, why not? He says, because you don't need that here. So he's like, well, why not? He says, because you, we have it here. So for you to enjoy and enjoy the moment. So the guy in the white shirt, the artist, he starts getting indignant. And he says, well, um, is Cezanne here, you know, is May, M M Monet here? You know, all these famous artists. And the angel says, everybody's famous in heaven. So he's like, what? Because everybody's famous in heaven. So he says, um, he says, if you were to go back, my, my paintings wouldn't be worth $5 in the United States or Europe, nor would yours. And the artist gets really indignant. And he's like, what do you mean? So he says, no, well, uh, I have to go back. I have to go back because I need to make sure my legacy is in place. My legacy is in place. So he has, he still holds on. And that's the theme of a lot of characters. And C.S. Lewis wrote it in regards to we as humans holding on to things that we still don't let go of. And the artist that wouldn't let go of, I need, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go write a manifesto. He says, I'm going to write a manifesto. I'm going to write a, a paper to really um, hold on to my legacy because I'm not going to let my legacy go because I'm here in heaven. So he wasn't, he didn't get it. He didn't get it. So we'll go on to um, the bishop. Now, those of you that read Dante's Inferno or, or excuse me, the Divine Comedy, he actually wrote into the words some popes. Three, I believe, I don't know their names at this moment, three that were in hell. They were in the layers of hell because 
he didn't like it when Dante, I think his name is Alligator. It's got a long name to pronounce. So in C.S. Lewis's uh, book, he writes about a, a seemingly a pious man and the man that comes to him was a seminarian, a seminarian. And he's talking to him and he says, you know, did you, uh, did you bring anybody? So the seminarian talks to, I'm getting the information here in a second. He says, did you talk to anybody? Did you bring anybody? He's like, no, no, no. So the seminarian tells the bishop, he says, do you know where you've been? And he goes, the angel says, you've been in hell. So the bishop says, no need to get profane. He's like, what do you think you've been? He says, oh, I don't know. You know, I have a theological association down there in this town. And I, I, I thought it was great, but I have papers and presentations to do. So his angel tells him, you know, there's a thing called the sin of intellect. So he's arguing back and forth uh, with him. And the seminary tells the bishop, if you don't go back, if you decide to stay, you've been in purgatory. But if you stay here, you know, you'll be at the foothills of heaven. So they go back and forth. And what I found really interesting about this particular conversation was the seminarian who's the angel tells him, you know, they both were seminarians when they were on earth. He says, when did you ever really put up a fight for your faith? And he says, all the popularity you garnered, book sales, invitations, you even got a bishop's ring. But when did you ever put up a fight for your, for your faith? And I found that really interesting. The seminarian angel says, will you repent and believe? And the bishop's like, uh, no, no. Um, can you give me any guarantees? I'll stay, but can you give me any guarantees that I can have influence and I will have um, freedom of inquiry and I can have um, any of those things. So the seminarian angel says, I cannot guarantee any of that. He says, you were given gifts and you've perverted them on earth. So the more he tried to like, come with me, you know? And he's like, no, no, no. He literally says, no, no, no. I have to go to a meeting that I'm, I'm doing a presentation and he still tries to help him. And he's like, no, 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 um, I've got to go do this. And that's how that character ends. And as you're reading character, character, C.S. Lewis, narrator, he's, he is observing these ghosts, these transparent ghosts that are being approached by whoever some person in their life that was sent to them to talk to them. And he's almost like eavesdropping. He doesn't mean to, but he is. And he's, that's how it's read. You're seeing this, these things play out and you're like, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And what I found most remarkable is character after character, they had in their mind really good reasons why they were not going to stay and why they were going to go back to the bus. And it really was insightful as to some of the things that I hold on to, I'll use myself as an example, I hold on to that um, I'm like, I don't want to be held bound by something that's foolish and stupid, that uh, I may be holding on to something that I don't want to. And that's some of the things that I, I use as a human being and some things that I also have been using in counseling when I'm talking to people, not about like, here's the Bible, read it, not anything like that, but uh, some of the things that they feel like this, they're holding on to some anger or anger and, and um, a resentment and really trying to talk to them about, you know, let's, let's process that out. What is it that you're holding on to the unfairness of it all? So I don't, you'll see, uh, any of you want the slides, um, deck of slides, that's not a little joke to Emily, haha, because there's a deck of, of pictures and stuff. I'll give it to you. Um, I want to talk about this last one here. Emily, can you show this? Let me move this here. This last two. Um, there's a lot of remarkable characters in this book, and it is a short book, and you would like have so much information. I'm like, I know, right? So there is a man, uh, a ghost at the end, not the very, very end, a ghost that comes up, and he has this little lizard. It's a red lizard. And he is, the lizard is talking to him, and this is the only ghost in the book that has some kind of creature on them. And the way it's written is really kind of creepy in the kind of way I was like, hmm. So this man, this ghost, and it's the way C.S. Lewis writes it is he's, he's steamy and he's smudgy and he's just transparent as well. And this little lizard, this red lizard is whacking its tail and it's whispering things to, to the ghost. And he's like, you know, you need me, you need me. 
and this angel here's a picture exactly of this this large angel comes and asks this smarmy smudgy guy um i see something like i see you're having problems with this lizard um so the guy's like no no it's it'll go to sleep it'll go to sleep it's fine he's like um can i can i get rid of it for you he's like no 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 and it'll go to sleep it's fine he's like can i kill it so the angel this big angel's like can i kill him he's like oh i don't know about that you know um it's just it's just this thing you know it's whispering to me and you hear as a reader the, the lizard's like don't let him kill me he'll do it he'll do it don't let him kill me you know because you know don't i bring you good dreams don't i bring you like and it's it's uh, the lizard is a representation of lust of lust that we have in our hearts and the lizard's like don't let him do it he'll kill me he'll actually kill me so each time the angel over and again will ask him permission can i kill it and he's like oh well you know i wouldn't say that you know so he was backtracking he's like let me just go back to the bus and i'll just get a second opinion and i'll come back tomorrow angel says there is no tomorrow there is no tomorrow so he fin he finally acquiesces right this smudgy guy he finally acquiesces and says fine fine you're gonna do it anyway go ahead and do it go ahead and do it so after asking three or four times this angel gets it crushes it he throws it on the ground and as he's grabbing it the the, the phantom the ghost is like you're hurting me you're hurting me stop it you're hurting me though he's squeezing on the lizard and the angel says there's not going to be getting rid of something dying to yourself if you will as we say in the faith without some kind of pain so he throws it on the ground and all of a sudden this particular guy and you realize that it's lust this particular guy becomes more solid whereas he was smudgy i'll say a third time and he was weak and he is he is walking on the grass because he had no weight because he had no substance you start seeing in this book as you're reading it he starts developing in some weight and some form and as he walks it no longer hurts his feet and the lizard transforms into a majestic animal which i'll leave that for you to read and now they have become one whereas this lizard was riding him representing lust and now he's riding this animal and it's it's really very moralistically interesting it's to see because we all probably could relate as as lewis has written this relate to what is it that i'm holding on to that maybe is keeping me back and it may be a i'm not here to give a tolerance vice smoking drinking all those things like that but it's it was very insightful for me to see uh we all can hold on to maybe that lizard may be representative of our resentment anger or anything that we hold on to um that was hard for us to let go so that's one of the brilliant things about this book is every character almost say for one has uh, maybe 10 characters has yet an excuse after excuse i can't i gotta give you this paper or i need to go write a manifesto or um there's some other characters in their book that are women that i didn't fit in because i didn't have enough space but you'll see and i think you'll really enjoy it we'll go on to the next slide so thank you Emily. so this um this one is one of three women and uh her name is sarah smith her name is sarah smith and what i found most remarkable about her is all of the photos over here so you can see so this looks really weird right so you get this really tall lanky guy and this little short character and this is how c.s lewis wrote about this one woman with what a very plain plain name so i actually took notes from the book and i'm going to read it directly so we can understand and sarah smith gets her own slide because it's really she's really remarkable she's really remarkable so when i said a little while ago that dante had virgil right in the divine comedy and c.s lewis had george mcdonald he himself was a um, christian fantastic fantasy type of novel writer in, in, in and of itself in his own great works so in this exchange that i'm going to read to you as I, you heard me say a moment ago, the narrator is observing these interactions from a distance while he's on this hard ground. And at one point, he's talking to his guide named George McDonald. And they're just observing, and I'm just going to read it straight from the book. Um, so C.S. Lewis says this, first came bright spirits, uh, not the spirits of men who danced and scattered flowers, boys upon one hand and girls on the other. And if I can remember the singing and write down the notes, no man who reads that score 
would ever grow sick or old. Between them went musicians, and after these musicians, a lady in whose honor all of this was being done. So as you're reading, you're reading this trumpet of, of musicians and boys and dancing and flowers. And, and so the narrator says to his guide, is it, is it, is it, is it? So McDonald says, uh, no, not at all, not at all. It's uh, someone you've never heard of on earth. Her name was Sarah Smith. So it seems such a, a, a trumpeting of, of boys and girls and flowers and animals and things like that. You would naturally think as a, it, it's the Virgin Mary, right? So Lewis is like, uh, through his interpreter, well, through his guide, uh, McDonald, no, no, it isn't. So he says, he's Irish or Scottish rather. He says, you have heard things that fame, you have heard that fame in this country, i.e. earth or i.e. heaven, and on earth are two entirely different things. So here's yet another thing, because you heard the artist saying, um, is Cezanne up here, you know, is Monet up here? He's like, no, everybody's famous here. What? Well, no, you know, I want to be special, you know. So he continues. So they're observing this woman and trumpets are coming in this great procession. It's fantastic. And you can see how beautiful she is. So Lewis asks George MacDonald, um, who is she? She's, he says, every young boy or every young man and boy that met her became her son. Every girl that met her was her daughter. So Lewis goes, well, what, about all, what about all the animals? What about all the animals? He says, a cat, two cats, dozens of cats. Look at all these dogs, birds and horses. Lewis is like, why can't I count them? Look at, look at all these animals. So McDonald says this, every beast and bird that came near her had its place in her love. And in her, they became themselves and Christ's love flows into them. So here's this woman who was just a plain woman on earth. No one knew her name. She, uh, she just, as they wrote, she just had like a, a boarding house or whatever it may be. And she had done these things just as we want to do maybe. And in earth, she was accompanied with such a great procession because that's how they were honoring her. So the little guy here, you'll see, this is also another character. Eventually, Sarah Smith, as the book progresses, she actually comes upon her former husband. The little guy is her former husband, his name is Frank. And, and the tall guy is what they call, it's hard to say, a tragerian. I think it's pronounced right, tragerian. And if you think about like, um, you just think like a mouthpiece, you think about someone who's like a, a marionette, we think someone like is, um, they talk to you, like ventriloquist, thank you. They, they talk through, so the short guy is the guy on the bus who came up and the angel that is attending to him to try to convince him to come up to heaven is her, Sarah Smith is his wife. The guy is a really uh, bitter and he has allowed his bitterness to be tied, it's again, moralistic story, his bitterness to be tied to this great figure that talks for him. So Sarah Smith in the book, she's trying to talk to her ex-husband, Frank, and he's like, did you miss me? And she's like, oh, I'm happy you're here. And she says, let me apologize for anything I ever did or didn't do. I apologize. And he goes, yeah, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you had to be without me this whole time, but I'm here for you now. And she goes, I, I don't need that now. I, I'm in love. I don't need any of that. Um, he's like, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't need any of that? You know, I was down there and I'm here now. And she goes, but you can be happy like me. And he goes on as this whole exchange happens. And the tra tra tragerian, the ventriloquist people talking for the feelings of this man who has all of his life dealt with a, a behavior that was used to make his family and then his wife uh, feel sorry, emotional blackmail, emotional blackmail. So she does apologize for maybe not being the wife or the person she wanted or he wanted her to be, but he still holds on to that. And it was really pretty familiar as far as a, as a clinician is hearing things that people hold on to. Again, that theme, what do you hold on to in life and then in death? That prevents you from accepting the grace of God or, 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 or salvation or anything that you want, if that's what you like, if that is what your, your cup of tea is. And I, I recognize there may be some viewers presently now. And then there is also some um, future watchers that, um, don't believe and, and that's cool you know whatever your cup of tea is but as he's as i'm listening to it and reading it 
uh, I discover a lot of the behaviors, a lot of these people that don't want to. And he, he wrote this book during World War II. It was, it was copyright in 1945. So a lot of his themes had to do with death. You know, that was the World War. So I thought it was really brilliant the way, the more she's trying to talk to this, her husband, Ghost, the tragedian speaks for him and the more he doesn't, you see like his, he looks mad, right? So the more she, Sarah Smith, doesn't give him what he wants, like, no, I missed you and you're so important. She's like, I, you know, I did miss you, but now you can have this, everything. You don't have to worry. The more she did not accept his emotional blackmail and um, pouting, the more he shrank, the more he shrank. And to that point of the tall guy was the embodiment of all his anger and frustration, right? Frustration and anger and, and, and angst and all those things. So it really was interesting. We can probably use that as a, uh, um, a lens that we as humans may do something when we're mad and passive aggressive or upset. And we don't, we let that manifest something, another person that's another part of us, if you will, and that's what this tragedian is, is, is written as, another part of her shrinking, diminishing husband. So it's really cool. Never seen anything like it. Um, I thought it was really interwritten. And um, that's Sarah Smith. So, so we'll go on to the next slide. Um, Suzanne, do you mind if we take a real quick pause because we're coming up on the hour? Do you mind if we raffle off prizes now to oh, make yeah, sure yeah, we get yeah, them yeah, folks? Yeah. In, just yeah, yeah, in case yeah. anyone's got to go to class or anything. Oh, good point, good point, good point. So, okay, I'm going to go in real quick, share my wheel of names um we're gonna spin oh that's cool i know i googled wheel of names and this came up <laughs> um uh, oh, okay kate presley you won our first book um dude you well, got like you got clapping in yeah come on that's yeah. awesome yeah. Yeah. we go hard at the library so it's like how we do <laughs> all right and Looks like Emily is our second winner. Awesome, congratulations you two um, on your raffle prizes. I'm going to stick my contact, hang on, I have to, I can't type and talk at the same time. There we go. Um, I put my email in the chat. Please reach out to me um, and let me know um, how best to get these books to you. You can come pick them up from the library. If you are not at TAMUCC, we might be able to mail them to you. So reach out, let me know what's gonna work best for you. Um, I also have to really quickly launch a poll. Um, if y'all are able, um, let me know if you're a student, faculty member, staff member, or if you're from the Corpus Christi community. Um, and that way we can sort of figure out like who's showing up to these, where can we market them? How can we get more people to come and listen to our awesome speakers like Suzanne? That's gonna help us out. Um, so thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, ending the poll now and going to return to our slides and Suzanne are we looking at the analysis slide now yeah just I know we're, we're, people thank you for being cognizant of the time Emily um really as I was listening to some scholars um and reading this book and again this book has been around since 1945 it has become uh they have made it into movies they have made it into plays it is there's some shorts on these per characters on on YouTube it's really stellar so one of the things, one of the scholars I, I really admire, uh, having read through this process, he said, you know, there, there's two people that are going to read this book, one who reads it and doesn't enjoy it, and one who reads it and is enriched by it. And I certainly felt enriched by it. Um, one of the, uh, another scholar that talked about, and there's actually a C.S. Lewis Institute, I kid you not, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to get on their mailing list. He talks about a lot of these characters being self-referential versus, well, you're, you know, you're trying to figure out what is it I want, and, and this is, okay, this is on the footings of heaven. So self-referential is it's just uh, a selfishness and versus a, a humbleness for asking for help. Uh, Lewis writes these characters, as I wrote here, uh, they struggle, they wrote these characters to help the living, us readers, who struggle in life with their, our own faults. So I did put some questions group discussion, but there's no time because I talk too much. <laughs> so the next slide is about a discussion. Um, after I read this book, and those of you that get a book actually, uh, or you can read it, you actually have on the last page, it has a small group um, website that you can have a discussion in a, a lot of uh, whatever a lot is defined as. Many people in church settings, whatever their faith is, 
actually can get a small talk discussion and it, the address is in the back of the book, which I thought was really cool. I did that too. So um, as a group discussion, it's just, we don't have enough physical time, but I did ask, you know, what myself, was this successful? Did I find it enriching? What did I like? What I did not like about it? I did add in you know, a comparative, the most comparative one is if there was to be a comparison is the divine comedy. We all know about um, Dante's Inferno and all those things like that. So last slide I want to add, and I, I reached out to human resources and I know that all of us, none of us will ever be immune from death. Everyone, everyone. And oftentimes we hold on to this loss and not reach out for free, what, free counseling. So I asked our HR department if they would, I mean, put an island in the thing because I'm so Islander, I'm telling you, man, um, feeling it, go Islanders, right? So I asked the island uh, HR department, Islander, if they would give me the information. So let me move this over here. There, there's the email. You, you have to um, be an employee. So it's unfortunately students, uh, but the students get to see the counselors here. So yeah, uh, there's some information. If you want any more information, Emily will have the slides. I will have the slides too. Um, it's free. Why would you not? so to speak. Sometimes people have an idea that counseling is going to be a certain way. And sometimes when they meet me, they're like, you're the counselor. I'm like, I know, right? I know. <laughs> so shocking. Um, so anyway, so that, that's uh, the great divorce in a nutshell. Thank you for letting me prattle on about some of the characters. They're really rich and cool. Um, I hope that you enjoy it. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, we do still have some time left. Does anyone have questions for Suzanne um, about the book or about counseling services or about ICAT, which she also is into and happy to talk about? Sure, truly, um, truly. Go truly. ahead and you can um, unmute if you'd like, or you can um, put a question in the chat, keeping an eye on that too. Um, while folks maybe are typing, I had a question for you, Suzanne. There's so much... Um, there's so much imagery, really interesting imagery in this book. Um, you know, you mentioned some of the, the imagery in the purgatory or hell with it's always raining and it's like the roofs leak and it's gray and gross. And we've got like the lizard guy who's on his back and all that stuff. Um, I was wondering if there was any particular image that really like resonated with you, like one you can't get out of your head, one that's just been, been meaningful for you. Well, that's a good question. Um, I... I... I do read the Bible sometimes, not all the time. And I do have a favorite, um, like Sarah Smith, to answer your question, Sarah Smith. So I do have a favorite passage, as most people that enjoy their faith and are enriched by their faith have a favorite passage or more. So I, I, I found it two or three times in this book, there uh, C.S. Lewis managed to incorporate some scripture, but he changed the words just enough to where it doesn't seem too biblically preachy, but I immediately recognized it. I immediately recognized it. And um, for Sarah Smith, they, as she goes on past her husband, who has shrunk uh, because his, his, his selfishness and disbelief and all those things, not necessarily disbelief in faith and, and, and going on, but his disbelief that, what, you don't miss me? And you, I did everything for you. And, I, and that's a real manipulation that, sometimes we fall prey to in other people in our lives. So she had, uh, the, the book goes on and it says, she, you start hearing singing. You, C.S. Lewis and George MacDonald start hearing singing. And the singing that they are singing to her is almost um, a mirror image of the Psalm 91. Psalm 91. And that's again, one of my favorites, um, but they worded, he worded it in a different way. And it's, it was really cool and different. And then earlier when the, the bishop, when he was speaking to the bishop, uh, the seminarian brother, Dick is talking to the bishop who he says, don't you have any in, an inquiry like a child, like a child, uh, when you're a boy, did you have an inquiry about what it's like? And the bishop who is a, a well-educated, um, experienced clinic or experienced theologian man, he, he went away from his faith and it talks about that. So even people that are, are seemingly in faith roles um, become really secularized, not that you have to be biblical, but he, uh, there's another, I think it's first Corinthians and he talks about, so the, the, the bishop says, well, when I was a boy, I played with um, childish things, but I became a man and I put childish things away. So I immediately recognized that as first Corinthians, which I thought was kind of cool. So the faithful person to me was really 
loving it. And I'm like, oh, I see what he's doing here. That's nice. That's nice. I like that. That's cool. So uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the characters that were more, more resonating for me are uh, the bishop and then Sarah Smith. Yeah. So um, it was interesting for me to see the bishop in there and have a little critique of religion as, as well as sort of a celebration of, of his faith. That was an interesting kind of a combo. Mm -hmm. Um, Emma Drumwright, um, thanks you for your presentation. Um, she so she didn't know the full definition of purgatory, neither did I. Um, and it was interesting to learn about all the different characters. Um, her question for you is, how has reading theological fiction or moral based stories impacted your own faith or life journey? Oh man, great question, man. I'm digging it. That's a great question. You're like, yeah, oh, you should get there like this. You could like the clock like confetti, like <laughs> clapping. Uh, well, as mentioned, I, I am a cradle Catholic, and I I actually found it, it enriched, enriched my faith. Uh, I I actually, I tried, I attempted, my friend Karen will tell you, I think I told her this story, I crack myself up sometimes. I, I tried to go this semester, um, or in January, because I told you I had this, this loss, these deaths that, that really profoundly impacted me further more than what I had other losses. So I tried to go to my fellow, my church, and um, uh, go to a... Um, a small group, a small group, right? And I got there and um, and I didn't like it. I didn't like it, even though it's the church that uh, of which my faith is. And I wasn't figuring out, I didn't like, I mean, it wasn't like they were mean or anything, but it, it, didn't, it didn't speak to me. Whereas this book spoke to me and, and the way he wrote, and it was really brilliant, I felt, to the point where, again, I started like, I'm watching the Chronicles of Narnia, I'm like, what's on Netflix, Hulu, I'm gonna watch this. And then I, I rented um, Mere Christianity, which it's not just for, every YouTube video says it's not just for faith-filled, it's also for people that are atheists or agnostic. So um, I have just been really super psyched about his um, his body of work. So it has it has um, enriched my, my faith and has, I feel like it's made me a better therapist when I'm attending to individuals that are dealing with their grief and have a spiritual side or those that don't have a spiritual side. Sometimes I meet students and they're like, God sucks. <laughs> Sorry, those of you that have seen this recording. So, uh, and sometimes I, I'll say, you know, how do you know God is not attending to you right now through me? And they're like, huh, yeah, all right. <laughs> good point. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's I hope I answered your question. Uh, where I've gone to my own church and tried to find like a small group, I just didn't enjoy it. And this book really like got me super stoked about my faith. Not that I was not so stoked. I was, I was stoked about it, but it, it was, it was uh, just a different perspective. And I think it, it, it's helped my bereavement. And like you said, you know, this book has provided ways to connect with other groups who are reading the same things and, and, you know, practicing at least a similar faith tradition if not the exact same so it is it is trying to provide that book for you or provide that that group for you um emma says thank you does anyone else have questions for suzanne um it's a lot of it's a lot to cover but i really suzanne i think you did a really nice job pulling out those really important characters some of the awesome imagery um and helping helping relate the book for folks who who are Christians and for folks who aren't, but who just like cool books. Um, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, um, if you guys uh, ever want like slides or anything like that, just uh, let Emily know and she'll give it to you. Awesome, um, yes, please reach out. Um, again, I'll stick my email in there. Um, I'm gonna spell my name right though. Uh, be sure to access the library. They have a lot of cool features and I'll plug in for the library. When I checked out this book, I found out something that I did not know is they actually put this neat sticker in there. So when a professor gets tenured, she can pick a book to sponsor, if you will, I guess. So it says, uh, Associate Professor Catherine T. Smith, uh, celebration or tenure and promotion in 2020. So I think that's kind of a neat little thing that they do. So um, Kathy Smith, we should meet one day and we'll talk about this book. Yeah, there you go. There's your new book club, Suzanne. You just found it. Great yeah. job. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, we are going to have a couple more book talks later in the semester, so keep an eye out on the library's calendar. Um, reach out to Suzanne in the Counseling Center. Um, reach out to your librarians. Um, check out this book if you want to. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.